Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm Nick Childs, I'm the Senior Fellow for Naval Forces and Maritime Security uh, here at the Institute, but I'm, my main reason for being here is uh, to be Master of Ceremonies for, for this event, which, um, as you will know, because you responded to the invitation, was originally um, entitled uh, Boots on the Ground, Continuity and Change in the Character of Land Warfare, with uh, my uh, esteemed colleague here, uh, Brigadier Ben Barry, our Senior Fellow for Land Warfare. Now, of course, in the West, the term boots on the ground is not just an expression of, um, or is not just an expression of character of land warfare. Um, it has a much more political baggage uh, than uh, that bland suggestion might lead you to believe. Um, it's both a totem uh, of military commitment as far as uh, uh, Western powers are concerned, but it's also, to some extent, there has also been a recoil from that commitment because of the experiences of Iraq and Afghanistan. And yet, uh, trying to devise a, a strategy for intervention um, using other people's boots on the ground has itself proved a problematic enterprise, uh, certainly as far as uh, major Western powers are concerned. Some others, however, uh, have perhaps had uh, better experiences of that, and I'm sure Ben will will uh, talk about that. Uh, but the goalposts have also moved in, 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 in other ways uh, as we reflect on uh, the changing character of land warfare from the Department of Defence downwards. Uh, the mantra now is that great power rivalry is back, and yet at the same time the counterinsurgency, counterterror, uh, non-state actor threats uh, to which uh, the West in particular has been focused in recent times haven't gone away. And then on top of that you add the elements of emerging, some might say emerged technologies uh, across the domains, but particularly in land warfare, um, all add to a set of conundrums as to how to uh, approach the future of uh, having effect on land, which even as a naval specialist I would uh, concede that ultimately uh, the application of, uh, of, of military power is to do with affecting events on the land. Uh, ben, um, amongst many of his um, uh, uh, past interests, has of course himself been a practitioner of the art of land warfare, but has both been interested in and actively engaged in issues around identifying lessons and learning lessons from Iraq and Afghanistan and also within the Institute uh, looking at the issues of innovation and adaptation for the future uh, in terms of the character of conflict generally. Um, I'll hand over to him, he'll speak for about uh, 30 minutes uh, and then we'll have a discussion for about the same amount of time. All of the uh, the proceedings today are on the record. Uh, ben, over to you. Um, these ideas are based on uh, research on the wars in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen, and also the challenge faced by many major armies. And I've been grateful for particular insights from the US, British, Australian, German and Dutch armies. Um, there are lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan that are of enduring relevance. For example, the factors that Clausewitz identified as distinguishing war from other activities, the effects of danger, the difficulty of gaining accurate information, the pervasive presence of friction, and war's political nature. And indeed, the ferocity of the armed opposition in both countries was a strategic shock. Against opponents who were determined to fight, armies who wouldn't fight, or whose governments wouldn't let them fight, were of little utility and often added military and political friction. The conflicts also demonstrated the unpredictability of war in which the enemy's got a vote and may fight to the death to cast it, a reminder that war is a clash of wills between actors seeking to shape events to suit their political aims. Attrition, manoeuvre, symmetric and asymmetric approaches all had their roles. 
Um, the war has reaffirmed that combat is the core military capability. Armies should be benchmarked against determined and ca capable enemies. And war's a contact sport. It's an outdoor sport and it's a dangerous sport for young men and increasingly for young women. It's also a multidisciplinary activity and a common theme at every level and on all sides was the importance of integration. For example, combined arms military tactics, <coughs> there are considerable improvements made in integrating air and land forces and special forces, <coughs> but also in fully integrating all levers of national power right down to the tactical level. The wars were characterised by armed politics and a battle for the narrative. This interpenetration and interdependence of war, politics and, extreme ex and accelerated communication through the internet, satellite, television and social media increased complexity and for all sides it created opportunities, risks and threats, again at every level. And the strategic, operational and tactical dimensions overlapped with a political dimension to tactical operations. And I think that's an enduring trend for future wars. And particularly electronic and social media greatly accelerated passage of information of various degrees of truth, rumour, falsehood and exaggeration. I'm often asked how would I sum this up, particularly with respect to some of the great strategic writers. Well, take the wonderful foundations of Thucydides, Sun Tzu, lay on top Clausewitz, Hobbes, Machiavelli, and General Sir Rupert Smith, but then lay on top of that a box set of House of Cards and another one of Game of Thrones. <laughs> put them on steroids and put them in a sort of mixer, and that's what you've got. And these trends continue to apply to current wars. They've often been described as hybrid conflicts. There's nothing new about conflicts that combine both state and non-state actors. Indeed, this is an approach that has sometimes defeated the British and sometimes been used by the British. There's also no shortage of insurgencies where towards the end of the insurgency the insurgents have deployed state-like capabilities. So one way of looking at, com at hybrid warfare is the comprehensive approach but gone over to the dark side. So it requires comprehensive strategies, operations and tactics to counter. Now following the recapture of Mosul last year by Iraqi government troops the US and its major allies celebrated the success of their approach by, through and with local forces. Now, the boots on the ground were Iraqi, but much of the intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance and the vast majority of precision weapons came from the US and their allies, and it worked. Um, it reduced Allied casualties and thus political difficulties in Western capitals, but it was utterly dependent on air superiority, and advisers had to have a credible understanding of combined arms warfare. And for most of the campaign against Daesh, most of the uh, coalition advisers have not been in the combat zone, with the possible exception of some special forces. Uh, we also saw an ever-increasing importance of precision air weapons, artillery and unmanned systems, including the unmanned systems used by Daesh and their precision land attack weapon, namely the suicide car bomber. But there is an alternative m model of by, through, with allies on the ground. And this is the one practiced in Syria by Hezbollah, Iran and Russia. This has made much less use of precision weapons, in part because the Russians don't have so many, but it's made more use of ruthless firepower. And Iran, Hezbollah and Russia have been prepared to allow their combat troops and advisers to go further into harm's way. We know this because of the casualties and the public funerals they get, the Iranian and Hezbollah casualties. We see an apparent stalemate in the war in Yemen. Now, one reason for this may be that neither the Saudi nor the UAE forces want to conduct dismounted close combat, and nor are they able to generate proxies who can do this to shift the balance on the battlefield. No single arm of land forces can operate entirely independently of each other. So they need to conduct operations on a combined arms basis, where the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. It's a lethal version of scissors, paper, stone. And of course, what we've also seen over the last 20 years or so is the vast majority of operations being inherently both joint and interagency. Now, there are plenty of advanced technologies that may well improve the effectiveness of ground forces. In the second half of my talk, I'll cover some of them. But what General J.F.C. Fuller 
called the constant tactical factor, where improvements in capabilities, tactics, or operational design are often checked by a counter-improvement, but the counter-improvement may be symmetrical or asymmetrical. This will continue to apply. Silver bullets, if there are any, may only be short-term in effect. Now, new military technologies and civilian technologies will create new opportunities. The challenge is going to be their integration into military forces, their doctrine and their organisations, both in peace and in war. And to best exploit these capabilities, there will often need to be a gearing mechanism that creates, that cre connects the capability with the formation in units on the ground. Land operations, for example, will increasingly extend into the cyber domain. Intelligence gathering by cyber means will continue to expand, including analysis of social media. Exploiting the potential of the range of military cyber capabilities will require integration of cyber activity with land tactical forces down to the lowest tactical level. And an example of an army that seems to be taking this forward is the US Army, which has formed tactical cyber warrior teams that deploy to the brigade level and for the last 18 months have been doing so on training exercises at the National Training Centre. Fighting in the Ukraine also illustrates how effective electronic warfare can be at disrupting command and control. And I have experienced that both on exercise and operations for myself. And I think we will also see convergence between cyber, signals intelligence and electronic warfare capabilities. So information operations, propaganda and the battle for the narrative is increasingly as important as conventional fire and manoeuvre, sometimes more important, as, it, as was demonstrated by Daesh. But the battle for the narrative will itself be a two-sided battle with a high-tempo action-reaction dynamics, and it too will need to be integrated into land operations at every level. Now, all these new capabilities and ideas cut both ways. There is unlikely to be a blue force monopoly. They will apply to red, grey, white, green, sky blue, purple, with polka dots on. OK, geography. Now, conflict on land will continue to be greatly influenced by geographical and terrain factors. For example, heavy armour will have great utility in open terrain, such as steppes and desert, while infantry will be essential in jungles and forest. But the real uh, change that's happening now and will continue to happen is the global megatrend of urbanisation. So urban operations need to be thought of as the new normal. Now, the complex terrain, shorter fields of fire and the presence of a population is often seen to defend to favour defenders over attackers, non-state armed groups over state forces. There's also a degree of what I call Stalingrad syndrome, with people associating urban warfare with that epic battle, or with Fallujah, or for example with the various sieges in Syria and, I and Iraq. But there are plenty of examples of urban operations where a degree of manoeuvre and less attrition has been achieved. Urban operations will need, require the full range of modern combined arms capabilities, including armour, combat engineers and precision fire. Now, some advanced technologies may well improve the effectiveness of ground forces in the environment, but the chance of a silver bullet capability providing long-term decisive advantage in urban warfare is low. But I have to be frank here, armies that are not competent in urban operations should really be considered incompetent. Of course, the Western way of war on land has been increasingly challenged, <coughs> and the way of war as practiced in Iraq and Afghanistan um, and Syria enjoyed largely uncontested control of the air, space and electromagnetic spectrum, and extensive use of contractors and huge operating bases. But of course, the modernisation of Chinese and Russian ground forces was not diverted by 9-11. So with NATO now emphasising deterrence and territorial defence, and the US military strategy requiring its forces to deter Russia and China, there's been a wake-up call. And the recent um, te testimony to the Senate Armed Forces Committee by the US Army's senior leadership very much gives you a, a, an impression that their main effort is countering Russia. But of course the Russians and Chinese and other nations are investing in anti-access and aerial denial capabilities to keep forces of all domains away at arm's length. This is often seen as a challenge for maritime and air forces, 
But it's also a challenge for land forces, for example, slowing down their ability to deploy to the operational theatre and to move within it. Although land forces have something to contribute in an anti-access and area denial scenario. And of course, as these um, uh, modern howitzers uh, in Moscow show us, Russia and China who are investing in modern armoured vehicles, air defence, electronic warfare and artillery. Russian brigades, for example, have an electronic warfare company, a dedicated air defence battalion, and over three times the mortar, gun and rocket capability of the average NATO brigade. Now, so the, for the rest of my talk, I'm going to focus, focus on uh, challenges and opportunities for the US and NATO land forces, but that doesn't mean we haven't got something to say about land forces elsewhere. So I'm going to look at some capabilities and try and predict where they're going and also <coughs> what the threats are. Let's start with infantry. Well, it remains essential, um, particularly in close country, complex terrain, in urban conflict, and encountering insurgency and terrorism. But it does require comprehensive modernisation. Although its protection was greatly increased in Iraq and Afghanistan by body armour, and there was also a revolution in battlefield, battlefield medicine, its offensive capability actually went down because of the, the extra weight. And last week, Secretary Mattis has commissioned a, you know, basically a task force to look at rebuilding um, the capability of dismounted close combat forces. Now, it seems to me that it's going to increasingly be possible to significantly improve soldier performance in the infantry and elsewhere through a variety of new approaches, including performance-enhancing drugs, personal implants, um, wearable technology, and application of genomic therapy. Now, legal and ethical factors may inhibit the adoption of this approach by the US and its, active, and its allies. Do any of you think that Russia and China will be inhibited by those factors? Uh, and widespread adoption of these technologies by civilians, for example, by computer gamers, may change attitudes. Um, the combination of firepower, protection, mobility and in some cases capacity means that armoured vehicles will continue to play key roles right across the spectrum of combat. They will be essential for high intensity combat including in urban areas. Now what we're seeing is a gradual feed fielding of defensive aid suites technology and this will change the armour anti-armour dynamics. Where they work, defensive aid suites will greatly reduce the effectiveness of anti-tank guided weapons and shoulder-fired law RPG type weapons. But the only army in the world that in public at least seems to have woken up to this threat is the Norwegian army. In the short term this will increase the importance of armoured vehicles guns. Tracked and wheeled armoured vehicles will continue to have complementary capabilities. Wheels with higher mobility, sorry, track vehicles with higher cross-country mobility, wheels with much better mobility on, ro on roads. Uh, but track systems are heavier and more expensive. But in the medium term, it may be possible to reduce the weight of track systems, for example, uh, with rubber band track. And advanced wheeled systems, particularly the, the application of um, advanced IT to the control of, of the wheels, uh, may well give wheeled armoured vehicles much better cross-country performance, so there might be conver convergence. And of course, wheeled vehicles will continue to be important for armies whose main role is internal security. There'll be a wide range of armoured vehicles types and weights, but armoured formations, I'm referring here to armoured brigades, armoured divisions, even armoured corps, they don't just need tanks and armoured infantry fighting vehicles, they need a, a wide range of armoured vehicles as possible. And ideally, the combined arms team should have a, the full range of armoured vehicles compatible with the nature of the formation. Um, armoured vehicles that swim will continue to have reduced protection levels. And, um, you know, as an example, when we look at the data in the military balance, there are very, very few armies that, in my judgement, have enough armoured bridging or armoured engineer vehicles. Now, that picture there is of a Daesh drone... Um, which has been uh, equipped to drop what's basically a modified 30 or 40 millimetre grenade. Um, and Iraqi government soldiers were killed by these, by these systems. And 
um, a variety of approaches were rushed into service by the Iraqis and the Americans to counter, to counter them. And what this illustrates is that small unmanned systems will rapidly proliferate and they'll have increasing utility to land forces, including to the individual soldier. Uh, small UAVs are going to be difficult to counter. Swarming systems in the medium term have great potential and nano unmanned systems that could rapidly explore buildings will greatly aid urban operations. And full ex exploitation of these capabilities may be limited as much by military imagination and cultural, legal and ethical consideration and other actors may be more limited. And I think it, it, it's also um, a truth that needs universal acknowledgement that non-state armed groups and media and non-governmental organisations and citizens will all operate small UAVs. I do wonder if many armies already behind the curve, um, with the exception of one army I'll mention at the end. And it's rather surprising that with the exception of the Italian army, we're not seeing um, small UAVs and small unmanned ground vehicles already in service with Western ground reconnaissance forces. Of course, this generates a requirement to neutralize UAVs. Now, for small ones, their size creates challenges. Although industry will sell you all sorts of UAV knockdown systems, I think a single silver bullet is unlikely. Indeed, at the recent International Armoured Vehicle Conference, every armoured vehicle manufacturer that got platforms was, you know, was displaying that they either got high elevation main armament or indeed the, gun, the thing was bristling with a machine gun that could be used against UAVs. So probably a combination of technologies, including small arms, uh, anti -aircraft, old fashioned anti-aircraft guns, directed energy weapons, birds of prey and fighter UAVs may neutralise the threat. And I think unmanned ground vehicles have a considerable utility in all sorts of roles, including, but not exclusively, as, as a combat vehicle. But um, what goes around comes around. IEDs aren't going to be uninvented and they'll be, continue to be used by non-state groups and the technology will improve and continue to proliferate. But they'll also be back to the future because landmines, which are basically professional IEDs as opposed to amateur IEDs, will return as a cheap defensive weapon and benefit from new sense of technology. And both IEDs and landmines can greatly reduce the tempo of land forces, as can natural and artificial obstacles such as rivers and anti-tank ditches. And combat engineer capability will become increasingly important but increasingly challenged. And 21st century engineers require a counter ID capability, obstacle breaching capability, both natural obstacles, artificial obstacles, minefields, and bridging capabilities. And armoured engineers will be essential for armed, armed forces. Now, the picture here is of a boxer armoured vehicle which has had a Rheinmetall um, laser system mounted upon it. And in Defence News this morning, uh, the US Army has confirmed that it's examining uh, another high-powered laser system as part of its, its full-spectrum air defence. Um, they may well be integrated into defensive aid suites for armoured vehicles as well, and become weapons in their own right, um, both in air defence but also in helping to um, degrade incoming mortars, artillery shells and rockets. Uh, although they are highly dependent on atmospheric condition, for example, I spent a lot of time in Singapore, it's always very humid, so the performance of lasers and range is going to be greatly, greatly degraded. The technology for radio frequency and non-nuclear electromagnetic pulse weapons exists. I mean, we've seen enough combat indicators um, to, to give us that assessment in the Institute. Now, such weapons may well be delivered by shell, rocket, missile, or bomb. They will have great utility against a wide range of battlefield targets, including armoured vehicles and headquarters. But again, they're unlikely to be a silver bullet, but best to use in combination with other weapons. Um, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, there has been a revolution on it since 2001, particularly integrating it into tactical land operations. And it will continue to develop. A wide variety of mili military and civilian capabilities could produce very high quality intelligence and targeting data. 
but there will be an enduring difficulty in managing and analysing the vast quantities of data and imagery generated. Now this can be partially overcome by using advanced analytics and machine learning to help, but prioritising commander's requirements will also become more important. And of course the enemy will attempt to neutralise ISR both directly and also by concealment, dispersion and deception. But we think there's going to be an increasing difficulty against an enemy that knows its stuff in concealing and hiding um, land forces. And again, I'm not sure how many contemporary armies have recognised this, yet let alone devised countermeasures other than camouflage nets. Indirect fire will become increasingly important and increasing in precision, and it will have the capability to cause significant casualties and damage to a wide range of targets, including armoured vehicles. Even the heaviest of, heaviest of armoured vehicles can be damaged and in some cases neutralised by very heavy indirect fire. And land forces will seek to employ as wide a range of indirect fire weapons as possible, which if nothing else will help offset reductions in close air support and attack helicopters in a contested airspace. And armies will want an affordable mix of unguided munitions, guided or, or sorry, unguided munitions that have had some guidance kits added to them, and also some sophisticated longer range and or ultra accurate munitions, and loitering munitions, and man in the loop missiles, such as the Israeli Spike Long Line of Sight, which is in service with the Israeli, the South Korean and the British armies they'll offer complementary capability. But the hard truth for the US and Navy and, and NATO armies is that currently their artillery is both outgunned and outranged by Russian artillery. And rockets, which are inherently cheap, being fielded by Russia, China and other nations will probably be really quite difficult to counter, particularly if you don't have air superiority. And it's interesting that Israel has declared one of its red lines with regard to Iran Hezbollah is the transfer of precision technology which can be applied to Hezbollah rockets. Um, <coughs> so all of this argues, as well as for attacking enemy artillery, active defence and the required technologies to actually damage or shoot down incoming indirect fire already exist and were applied um, to some extent in Iraq and Afghanistan and this includes radars, guns, missiles, directed energy weapons. The trouble is a lot of those options are very expensive but if they could be integrated into a platform that was small, robust and cheap like you know the size say of a Gepard tank that used to that can't have a lot, that accompany a lot of armoured forces in the Cold War um, they could actually greatly reduce casualties. And my final capability, I'm sorry, final capability I'm going to talk about is command and control. Um, now, networking of land forces will continue, and both sides will also be constantly trying to intercept and attack each other's networks. And there is a question about whether armies can fight unplugged. Um, and the constantly changing battlefield dynamic, dynamics, terrain, and threat from cyber and electronic warfare requires networks that can constantly reconfigure themselves and have a self-healing capability. And the command and control of urban operations is going to be particularly challenging because of the reduction of radio ranges and how radio traffic further degrades inside buildings, as many of you may have found as you wandered around the Institute trying to uh, get a phone signal, let alone a 3 or 4G. But there are options that can help with this, including cellular radio networks, and the use of unmanned systems rebroadcast re stations. And I don't know if you saw any of the news reports from Raqqa, where the um, anti-ISIS forces actually were using iPhones and iPads right on the front line. Now, there wasn't any new coverage of how that was achieved, but obviously the technology to do that was deployed close to the front line in urban, urban combat. And I think right across the board... Um, we may well see compression of the decision action cycles. I mean, there's, there's no doubt that from uh, defence of naval task forces against attacks by sea-skimming missiles, or indeed ballistic missile, missile defence, networking it 
and also handing over authorities to the system to make those split second decisions greatly improves the, improves the effect, effectiveness on it. Headquarters are going to need to form reconnaissance strike nodes, for example. And this high temper will also apply to aspects of the battle of the narrative where messaging may have to be rapidly adjusted and also you may rapidly want to try and shut down the en enemy's messaging. But there still will be other areas of activity that will require a long-term approach, for example, logistics or reconstruction. So what? Well, uh, we shouldn't be excessively pessimistic. Of course, in theory, national defence policy and priorities, as well as strategic geography, should determine the roles, capabilities and size of armies. In practice, Clausewitz's trilogy, People, Army and Government, often interact in a complex mixture of attitudes, resource allocation, decisions and non-decisions that are now affected by mass media in a way that will probably am amaze Clausewitz. But given the rapid pace of military and technological change, as well as the complex wars that are actually being fought, it would be foolish to make detailed predictions. But I think what, what this slide shows here is an army that's engaging the future that's trying to keep its cutting edge as sharp as possible, ought to be doing all those things. And in my time in the British Army, sometimes it was very good at it with regard to some capabilities. Sometimes it actually was a bit embarrassing. For example, it gave up doing market monitoring or R&D on small arms in the second half of the 1980s and rushed to catch up in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, the experimentation thing. Um, Thomas Edison once said that the real measure of progress was how many experiments you could do in a day. Um, a lot of these new capabilities, they either exist or they exist in prototypes. And I think a very good example of this, on which I will close, is the initiative that's being taken by the Australian Army. They're basically going to give every unit in the Australian Army, regular, reserve and cadet, a box of drones as few restrictions as possible, telling them to use them, and at some time in the future report back on what they've been good for and what they've been less useful for. And it's that sort of thing, plus the enormous potential that now exists in virtual environments to try out military ideas. That's what every army should be doing now. So there we are. Thank you, Ben, uh, for a, a, a target-rich um, tour of the horizon. As uh, land water is concerned, we've now got about 25 minutes, just over 25 minutes for the discussion. So, if you'd like to, to raise any points uh, with Ben, then uh, do catch my eye, and, and, and if you do, do uh, identify yourself uh, for the benefit of others. Um, I'll kick off, if I may, in my uh, master of ceremonies uh, privilege role. Um, you, you, at the end, were saying. Um, one shouldn't be overly pessimistic in terms of the challenges, and yet the prescriptions across the board and the sort of deficiencies, particularly in, shall we say, Western capabilities, because the focus has been elsewhere, seem so significant in, in, in many respects. Yes, there's experimentation, yes, there are sort of potentially non linear ways of making up those differences, uh, but surely you're not going to get away from the fact that some of these uh, prescriptions will require significant investments if if your answer uh, or your question is still how do I sustain the capabilities at the level I have in the past or do you have to change your level of ambition? So you know where 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 are the where are the potential trade offs such that uh, the if you like the mountain that some armies are going to have to climb Okay, well, if we look at the driving threat on this Russia and China, they've got advantages, like this big overhang of artillery. They've also got a lot of stuff, and they can move stuff on interior lines. Now, in the case of China, the army is quite clearly the armed forces at the bottom list of, of priorities. But Western militaries, including uh, people doing peace operations may well encounter Chinese equipment elsewhere because uh, they're selling it very well. Um, Russia has advantages, the artillery overhang, 
um, the fact it can concentrate force on NATO's borders more quickly than NATO. On the other hand, um, it has far... It doesn't have a generation of leaders, middle-ranking and senior leaders, um, who've been selected in the heat of fire in Iraq and Afghanistan, though, of course, its leaders are not... Pre, you know, they don't suffer preconceived notions from Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, it has some very good equipment, but not all of its equipment is as good as NATO and US standards. Um, I suppose we should take comfort in the fact that the US have increased their forward presence and look to be investing serious money in the European Reassurance, Reassurance Initiative. And also that... Um, you know, a number of European countries have significantly increased their their defence spending. Um, and I think also, um, A, there's scope for imagination on tactics and operations, and B, um, and B, you know, deterrence has worked so far, so Russia hasn't gone to war with NATO, the Enhanced Europe Forward Presence Initiative, although its battle groups are very, very multinational, um, has greatly increased um, NATO Army's expertise on operating in Poland and the Baltic states. Is there is there a danger of, um, as the particularly the United States sort of drives forward with its uh, you know, attempt to innovate and adapt and third offset and so on? that that will present as many challenges for its alliance partners, its friends, as the new foes that it is now dealing, potentially having to deal with in terms of interoperability and integration going forward. Yes. Um, and this has been a perpetual challenge on the whole of my military, military career. So what's really important is that both the US Army and the US Marine Corps, because the US is big enough to have two armies, um, and their allies continuing to invest in plugs and sockets to make interoperability easier. And I think the sort of NATO standard is what's really important is secure voice communications, secure data, and the ability to fire things across each other's boundary. So, say, a Belgian artillery battery can fire it in support of a, a US battalion. And I think there's a lot of practical work going on that, which the forward deployment of the US will, will um, help with. What's just as important, though, is interoperability of the mind. And there was quite a high degree of interoperability of the mind achieved in the second half of the, the Afghan war. And actually, this is where NATO and also the way um, the armies exchange personnel and particularly exchange people on key training, like staff, staff college, that, I think, really helps. And to give an example, I was at a... Um, a British Army conference for three days last year and there was significant participation from Germany, from France, uh, from Denmark uh, and Australia. Um, and provided you've got open-minded people in the middle and senior leadership who are willing to learn from each other, that interoperability of the mind ultimately is the most important sort of interoperability. So you have yeah. I've got multiple questions. Um, the first one is... Um, can we just take them just one say, at a time? Just say who you are as My well. name is Archibald, a member of IM the Institute. Um, first of all, um, you did not address the issue of um, private militaries in, um, in relation to how future um, combat is going to look like because um, some countries are now having to use forces in combat. And secondly, um, the issue of quantum um, computing um, technology, like the technology in space warfare as, um, as a hybrid um, use in land warfare. Basically, um, you, were mentioned, you mentioned something about iPhone and uh, um, I, iPad used by ISIS and Frontline. Should there be a quantum technology that should come into force? It means that all technologies that the military is now using will be wiped out and they will not be able to engage. Okay, uh, let's take it there because if you've got any other questions, we'll have to take your turn. Um, there's nothing new about private military actors. Um, it's the Walter Raleigh 
you know, one of Queen Elizabeth's sea dogs, privateering, was a private enterprise, state-sponsored piracy. And it was, you know, significant in edging the Spanish out of the Caribbean, for example. My guess is, if you were an ordinary decent Afghan or or Iraqi citizens of Baghdad in about 2005 to 2007, you would have thought private military companies were, were a disgrace and a menace. Because the evidence is that in terms of their application of rules of engagement, they were out of control. And in terms of aggravating the problem of both countries feeling they're under occupation, they, you know, they um, exacerbated it. Although there are examples of black including with their own private helicopters, actually going to the rescue of small groups of desperate men and women, trapped, for example, by the sheer uprising in 2004. Um, I think, though, that in um, a sort of NATO Article 5 scenario, or indeed a sort of US-China type war, you know, the phenomenon of A2AD and the amount of indirect fire would limit but not totally exclude the role of private military companies. There is an alternative approach which the UK uses called sponsored reserves, which is a slightly misleading title, but it means you can have a contractor providing a service in peacetime, but part of the contract is that come operations you mobilise some or all of the contractors as reserves. And once they're mobilised as reserves, they can easily get, be given orders. I think also any country contemplating future use of private military companies, they've got to have some really hot legislation, say responsibility, accountability and command and control is not as ill-defined as it seems to have been, for example, in, in Baghdad. Uh, the British are appro- uh, uh, approaching a whole force, uh, you know, much about a whole force approach um, and they seem to be working quite hard, of it, hard on it. It'd be interesting to see what comes out in public. On quantum technology... Um, you know, China does appear, at least in public, to have a leading role in world research, particularly in trying to establish quantum communications over over distance. Um, though whether quantum communications will be as uncrackable as they say, particularly if in parallel quantum computing is, is, is fielded, my suspicion is that it will be some time before quantum technology is ro- robust enough for example, to be fit, fitted in a battlefield armoured armored vehicle. Um, and we shall see. But, uh, you know, there's a considerable amount of money being spent on researching this in public, including by industry, and you can bet your bottom dollar that countries that spend significant proportion on R&D are busy working on the defence and the military applications. So, uh, welcome, Sinclair, from the Australian High Commission. Mm. Um, I was very intrigued by uh, your comment of the uh, US versus Iran, Hezbollah and Russian model of by, mm. with and through. And I was just wondering with your uh, research if you've uh, discovered any particular pros and cons of the, uh, the Russian model that would be of interest. Well, <coughs> the, I mean, the jury's out. Um, you know, probably the US model has, re- has wrecked those cities that ISIS took over less than the Russian-led model. And at the centre of the Russian-led model is their approach to urban warfare, which I think was sort of proven in Grozny, the Second Battle of Grozny, because basically it was a ruthless siege. Now, in the kickoff of Operation Iraqi Freedom, in Basra, uh, and Baghdad and in Nasiriyah after the US Marines had a bit of problem initially what you saw there was smart sieges um, or rather the plan for Baghdad was a smart siege which was a lot more humanitarian trying to cause a le- lot less um, civilian civilian suffering um, so I think history will be, you know, it's too early to tell now that's not meant to be an excuse but what is quite interesting is that the, the Iran has an organisation Cod's Force of the you know, Revolutionary Guard Corps. And Cod's Force does set, has several different things that the organisation does. It's uh, special forces, it can do terrorism, it can support terrorism, uh, and it quite clearly can work um, with indigenous forces and it can raise and field militias, as Iran has done with a whole battery of sheer militias from other countries. And the other thing is, it's the policy lead for Iraq, for Syria, and the Lebanon. And indeed, uh, 
Cod's Force leader, General Qasim Soleimani, um, you know, there was a, a text messaging exchange between him and General Petraeus ten years ago when he said, you should be aware, General Petraeus, that I control Cod's Force and the Iranian ambassador in Baghdad is a Cod's Force officer. Now, this is actually, it's what we would call a joint interagency task force. Um, and it's a joint interagency task force that's being employed on the dark side. Now, having that sort of capability in one box with one person who's in charge of it, and a person who, by the way, who, you know, you could do an interesting parallel between his, his career and General Stanley McChrystal's. He's also a sort of warrior monk who will put, put, turn up with his camp bed in his sleeping role at a full militia brigade headquarters and spend the night. Um, and he, it is also reported he was instrumental in briefing Russia that if you don't intervene now, you know, the Syrians might lose. Um, you know, I think that's a very interesting example to hold up against the highly problematic efforts that a lot of Western countries had in the first half of Iraq and Afghanistan making the comprehensive approach work. And also, you know, how you keep the comprehensive approach alive in so-called peacetime. That's, that, I think, is at the heart of the, heart of the thing. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Ingham. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the author of a study on the military covenant and most recently researcher to General Lord Dannett on his history of the British Army. Um, I was very interested in what you were saying about super soldiers mm. and these sort of high-tech um, paragons mm. of, of combat. And I'm wondering whether West, the West in particular doesn't have to go down this route because we have to overcome civil society's natural squeamishness at the moment about putting our forces in harm's way. Something that, say, doesn't really apply to non-state actors or indeed to China and mm. Russia in quite the same way. They don't have quite the same scruples. There would be no, say, wooden bassett effect um, on mm. Russian state TV, I imagine. Thank you. The business of the reluctance to put boots on the ground um, and for having to go in harm's way, but what I de detect in a number of armies um, the US Army, the British Army, the US Marine Corps, the Australian Army, um, and for example the Estonian Army, is that you know they, they've gone back to concentrating on their, their combat ethos. And if the political situation changes, you know, there's an awful lot of soldiers, Marines, special forces who will be very happy to go back in harm's way because they'll feel actually that the thing will be solved more quickly, possibly with less political problems. Well, we have been there before. Um, but intentions, policy intentions, can change in a minute. I mean, think of those recent terrorist attacks in Manchester and London Bridge. How many British people would have to be killed in a terrorist attack that was, say, directly linked to ISIS in Nangarhar province, Afghanistan, for the British government to say, gloves off? Seen as, seen as well managed I mean there was you know a steady trickle of British casualties from Northern Ireland indeed in the height of the campaign 71 
uh, to about 78, um, there were battalions that served in Northern Ireland that had casualty levels greater than that of a British battalion that had a good tour in Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, similarly, if you look at the Falklands War, you know, in five weeks, 250 British people were killed. And, you know, broadly speaking, it was seen as a pretty just war. And almost the justness of the war has subsequently been reinforced by the fact that as a result, the Argentines threw out, you know, criminal dictatorship. Um, th there's another thing as well. Um, okay, let's play the scenario that the British army goes into combat against an army that has fielded super soldiers with all these technologies. And as a result, British soldiers are at fault and either the mission doesn't succeed or there are excessive casualties or Brits subsequently end up sort of, you know, being burnt alive in cages or whatever. Um, I, think, I think then explaining to the group of grieving parents, wives, brothers and sisters why Britain had not embraced this technology know, uh, knowing that they could have done you know I think that could be very very difficult for a Prime Minister or a Defence Minister or a Chief of Defence to explain I mean the same point applies to weapons with degrees of autonomy so there you know th this business about ethical issues are all about limiting the use of technology when in some cases they might be about exploiting the technology and what I think it also means for the leadership of armed forces and their R&D is they've got to do the research. They've got to do the research so they can know how to counter it. And they've also got to do the research that if the context fails, you can flick the switch and either change the way the technology operates or at least start, start intro introducing it. I mean, as an example... Um, there is a tree, uh, you know, there's an international agreement against the use of blinding laser weapons. Well, that's jolly good, and actually, you know, critical mass of nations have signed up to it. Before that treaty was signed, the British Army had invested a great deal in protection, um, you know, including some very clunky laser counter laser goggles, which were actually issued to all the British troops in Operation Desert Storm. Does that help? And by the way, General Dunnett's and Sarah's book is quite excellent. <laughs> and I learned a great deal about it, about things I didn't know about, like particularly the post-war British occupation of Germany. Andrew. Um, Andrew Brooks. Um, but, um, that wonderful list you've given us, it's, it's pretty obvious to most of us that Britain can no longer afford to cover all the bases on its own. Um, and we're either have to go and take stuff off the shelf from Uncle Sam or cooperate to a far greater degree with our European allies. One of the sad things to me was when um, the Prime Minister and Monsieur Macron went to Sandhurst, they just talked about helping us to put together a platoon for Estonia. Do you see much potential for really seriously cooperating with the Germans, with the French, to do some of the actions you've vividly outlined? Because I don't think we can do it on our own. And unless we do it there, and some other person, whatever you want to call it, then we're going to just all fall behind the wayside. And then, if you like, we can uh, sort of victory in the shop and go for us. Well, the answer is yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, you know, in the case of the British land component, which of course also includes the Royal Marines 3 Commando Brigade, Battlefield Helicopter, all three services. You know, it's actually below the size of the French land component, and the current financial pickle that the British are in could see it reduced or further. Um, I mean, there are some strengths in, in, in British capabilities. For example, um, they've got good artillery, not enough of it. Um, they've got some good armour, they've got some interesting armoured programmes. The Warrior Capability Update, for example, is the most ambitious armoured vehicle update programme that I know of. Um, and British also, like the Americans, have been quite good at times in fielding black programmes. So suddenly something that's been going on in secret has suddenly ended up being fielded in the front line. And that's the whole story of why they were world leaders in counter-improvised explosive device. Um, but you're right. I think you know, the impression I get from the British military is they've really got the message about cooperation with France, 
you know, there are French exchange officers in all sorts of places in the British Army now, uh, and they want to do more, no doubt about that, both in terms of training, but also in terms of learning from the very successful approach in Francophone Africa, to the extent that there are pretty, there's a British liaison officer embedded with the French West African headquarters right now. Um, I think in the case of Germany, um, the British learned a great deal about armoured warfare uh, from the Bundeswehr in the um, 1980s, and they learned a great deal from the Americans as well. Um, and it's my eternal regret that the British actually at some stage didn't buy the Leopard 2 tank rather than the tank they've got. But anyway, um, I think there are opportunities, though, for Germany to, to help the UK. Um, the British have only now got a brigade minus left in Germany. They still run on NATO's behalf, the Central Armour Training Centre. And um, there's another facility somewhere in, in, the, in the west of Germany, in Rhine or something. Well, the British plan, driven by budgetary reasons, was to, was to shut those down. I mean, they could have been handed over to another NATO country or put us there with no one to take them over their clothes. Uh, Gavin Williamson, the UK Defence Secretary, in his parliamentary announcement did say that that was up for reconsideration. Now, that wouldn't come free, but if um, the German Defence Ministry wanted to help that... Um, you know, for example, in driving down some of the costs that the British were paying uh, to Germany, and also overcoming environmental opposition, because Seven Arbor Training Area has been it's been assumed is going to become a nature reserve. It's already a nature reserve by virtue of being a training area. <coughs> but um, the other thing the British haven't done um, is they ha- they haven't really gone as far into multinational formations as Germany or um, the Netherlands. There's a German-Netherlands corps, which is a fully joint uh, corps headquarters, and the Dutch army, their armoured brigade, sorry, their 43rd mechanised brigade, is now an additional brigade for a German panzer division, and within it, it has a Bundeswehr tank battalion, the Dutch having given up tanks, which itself has a Dutch tank company. Similarly, the Dutch Air Air Mobile Brigade is part of uh, the German Rapid Response Division. Um, The British have usually been quite cagey about this, uh, but I understand that the remaining rather small British amphibious bridging capability is effectively a component of a larger German unit. And um, if Dr von der Leyen wandered in, I mean, I'd say, you know, there's a lot of things you could probably do to encourage um, Anglo-German military cooperation over and beyond that which there is. Kurt, do you, do you have a view on that? No, I'm interested. I fully share your point. Uh, there's much going on behind the curtain between Germany and France. And, yeah. and, uh, and I feel a bit embarrassed as I'm the industry representative yeah. here in this room. You'd better introduce yourself. <laughs> Uh, probably, probably, uh, given the fact that the UK Army is looking for it, but it will go for, I think, 15 years now, and had originally engaged in development of the boxing and just on display here. Uh, then pulling out of the program because uh, the boxing was not air transportable in the C 130. Uh, having spent, I think, uh, something around 300 pounds over the last 15 years working with high essential. Maybe here's another opportunity uh, to at least drive a bit of interoperability uh, and create a new way by its standard. Uh, and now I'm close to you know, delivering, delivering something like an advertising pitch. Uh, but uh, please don't mistake me for that. Uh, I, I don't want to do that. It's just about interoperability. But uh, at that point, Jan, uh, I would also like to, uh, to uh, pose a question. Do we have a capability, uh, do we have a mobility challenge inside NATO? Given the fact that we have not been taken by surprise uh, of the uh, actions Russia has taken in Ukraine, uh, and given the fact that we, in the NATO-Russia Act, have committed not to permanently deploy NATO troops in the form of countries, uh, things that swirl around in the heads in my company are, well, if something or 
we are absolutely incapable at the moment to deploy heavy armor. Also, given the fact that we do not have even the railway transport capacity in the <coughs> continent of Europe. So there is a huge gap between air transportable groups with little assertiveness and heavy armor. Mm. Um, and in discussions we have inside my company, this is one point that ever returns. Uh, we have a mobility issue. If you do not, if you are not allowed mm. to deploy to deploy uh, armies permanently in a country, then you have to be fast. You have to be quick. Uh, and you have to carry a wide capability spectrum over, say, at least a thousand miles. Mm. Uh, would you share this point of view? Thank you. And uh, your company is Kraus Maffei. Kraus, yeah, sorry. Uh, Kraus Maffei Wegman. Uh, uh, we are the manufacturer of the Leopard 2 main battle tank. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I think I probably have to make this yeah. a lot okay. faster. Um, this is a, this is a recognised problem, you know, which, for example, applies to um, the US Army in. South Korea. Uh, it was a driver towards medium medium capability, but that medium capability itself, there were hard questions about the actual prospective protection as a result of IEDs in Iraq and Afghanistan. In the specific case of NATO Europe, I mean, the first thing is that General Hodges, the recently retired commander of US Army Europe, he called for a military Schengen. Because the US brigade, particularly the Striker Brigade combat team, which had its battle groups moving all over Europe, you know, it couldn't drive across an internal border of EU like it, they could in their personal cars on holiday, and went through you know some very lengthy bureaucracy. So, if you could have an EU military Schengen, which did actually exist in within NATO uh, in the 1980s, that would be a good thing. Um, the second thing is, uh, can you at least? start stockpiling heavy ammunition, heavy combat supplies, um, and also ammunition and combat supplies, which you stockpile for your own nation, but like NATO standard 155 artillery, is an emergency usable by other, other people. And I think there's potentially quite a lot the EU could do here. I mean, if it really wanted to make the military Schengen work, it could do. And the, you know, the permanent structured cooperation initiative of most EU countries you know, that could help it as well. But I think, actually, there's, there's... Rather like I said about experimenting with small drones, actually, you need to do stuff. You know, so railways need to be given money to move tank battalions around. Um, and that in itself uh, will help. Although I would observe that the further east you go, the more NATO's shortage of bridging and also shortage of ground-based air defence... Uh, the more concerned I'd, I'd be. Yeah. I hope that helps. Thank you very much, and apologies. I know, I know you had a, a question, but we've uh, already busted our uh, official schedule. Perhaps you can uh, pursue it, uh, collar Ben, and uh, for a one-on-one um, uh, after after we've finished here. Uh, before I ask you to, uh, to thank uh, Ben for his uh, presentation and responses, it would be remiss of me not to mention that, of course, hot off the press. Uh, is the uh, annual compendium that the Rival uh, produces of, uh, of military, the military balances of 171 uh, countries around the world, and some of the trends that uh, Ben has highlighted uh, are uh, revealed and, and explored in the data in that book, which uh, has been out uh, just a, a couple of weeks now, and uh, it, it has some key things on defense expenditure, on and great power, the revival of great power and capabilities and the responses to that. Um, so uh, I, I on, on behalf of the editor who is sitting <laughs> here, um, I, I commend that to you. Uh, but um, I, I must thank uh, Ben both for his thought-provoking uh, presentation and his thoughtful responses to some very interesting interventions from around the table. So thank you, and, and please uh, offer the traditional thanks to our speakers.